Hi, I'm Jody Cohn, and I am so honored to have someone I deeply admire, my friend Nikki, who is an award-winning functional health practitioner and transformation coach. She helps people optimize energy, especially by tapping into their parasympathetic state. In 2005, she co-founded one of the largest mind-body clinics in integrative medicine in the United Kingdom. The results with patients at the clinic were published as a preliminary study in 2012 that I'm hoping you'll talk about in the Brit British Medical Journal Open. In August 2015, she hosted the largest free online health summit on overcoming fatigue, which I think relates to the vagus nerve and um, vagus nerve infection hypothesis, and interviewing 29 world leading experts on optimizing energy with over 30,000 attendees. Since then, she's spoken on over 40 large online health summits, reaching over a million people worldwide. And I love your message about staying calm to kind of navigate through the storms. And I'm hoping you can just tell people a little bit about trauma, all kinds of trauma, and how that kind of correlates with your parasympathetic nervous system. Thank you so much for having me, Jodie. It's great to be here on such an important topic. People need to understand about the vagus nerve and staying calm and how to do that. So just as a little bit of, of my background, I, I started with uh, working with people with on the severe end of chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and you know the, the housebound, bedbound, 25% that are kind of really in a bad way. And the clinic that you mentioned that I co-founded, we always had a functional health nutrition division and we always had a psychology division. We always co-treated people with both oh, brilliant. approaches. Yeah, because we realized from an early stage, right from the beginning, that this that we needed the underlying psychological support as well as the physiological support because right. the mind and the body truly are one thing. Exactly. And and this, your state, your emotional state of being translates into your biology and the root of how that communicates on a big level, not the entire picture, but a large part of how the mind and the body communicate is via the vagus nerve and via the autonomic nervous system, which is what we understand as being the fight flight response that triggers the sympathetic side. And what we have is the parasympathetic side, which is mostly made up of the vagus nerve. This is just rehearsal for people, but you know, a bit of revision. Yes. But it's always good. I'm glad that we get the sort of general public and health aware people. We want to be able to talk about the vagus nerve and not have to explain it's part of the autonomic nervous system. And the vagus nerve is the opposite of the fight flight response. And the vagus nerve innervates tons of organs in the body. It's the nerve of compassion. It's the nerve that when you stimulate it, you feel connected to yourself and others. Yes. And what I found is that so many chronic complex illnesses and fatigue is the poster child, fibromyalgia and fatigue are the poster child uh, illnesses for low vagal tone. So yes. low vagal tone being someone stuck in the chronic state of stress. Yes. Now, it's not just a nervous system thing it's everything it's it's the genetic expression so what happens with trauma and especially early life trauma is that it changes the epigenetic expression of how we respond to stress so we only need a little bit of stress that will cause a huge stress response and it epigenetically shifts so that we are stuck in sympathetic we have an epigenetic reset of the nervous system causing us to get stuck in a stress response as a response to early life stress. Now, the early life stress thing, this is sort of one of my areas. I, it's the main area I focus on. Early life stress being early life trauma, basically. Yes. The reason being that huge studies by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente confirmed that 67% of all adults have had early life stress. And that was the tip of the iceberg. That was an underestimate. And that was 17,500 adults were, were kind of assessed. We also know through mainstream science that 55% of all adults have attachment trauma, which means, you know, it's when we talk about trauma, most people think of it as PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, they think of it as some kind of car accident, so physical trauma or something really extreme. They don't realize the little minor traumas that can add up. Right, this is it. And you know, PTSD in response to a discrete event, it's usually a single event, not to minimize that, that has a huge impact on somebody. Exactly. 
The issue is though, it's relatively rare compared to attachment and developmental trauma. And the other thing is about developmental and attachment trauma, which I'll explain more about exactly what that is. It makes you much more prone to develop PTSD in response to adult stressors. Right, because you've been primed. Your brain is primed to be more receptive to the stress chemicals. Exactly. And this is where they, they did studies of the, the soldiers coming out of war zones. And some of the soldiers would get PTSD and some of them right. weren't getting PTSD. The ones that got PTSD in response to that very stressful adult event all had much more developmental and attachment trauma. So I, I don't deal with PTSD or treating that or resolving that I refer people for that there's very specific things you can do for that type of trauma right. which is like EMDR movement desensitization and reprogramming it's perfect for the kind of I, I do EMDR the uh, yes. basically eye tracking it's amazing it really yes. does help reset your nervous system yes and that's part of it if you have PTSD but my core sort of mission if you like is raising awareness about this developmental and attachment trauma because it's to do with emotional bonding with your key caregivers at a young age from it even starts preconception right so, so if mum's stressed out depressed and unhappy while pregnant with you that is being transmitted to baby it's transmitted right. to baby we also have intergenerationally inherited trauma where we know that traumas that our parents and grandparents have been through affects us epigenetically, it's been shown. Um, this is why third generation survivors of the Holocaust victims have the same psychological and physiological expression as their grandparents who are in the Holocaust. So it's not a controversial thing anymore. It shouldn't be controversial in the science anymore to confirm that trauma is intergenerationally inherited. And we think we right. sort of you know, environmental factors aren't inherited. Actually, they are. Right. And that's why a family constellation therapy, things that can clear past trauma are really powerful. I mean, I would love you to land a little bit more on trauma because I think people think, you know, oh, well, there was food on the table and a roof over my head, you know, but maybe you were a latchkey child. Like, what does that mean? Can, yes. can you explain more about attachment therapy and how these, these little minor traumas that we might dismiss or not even realize are affecting us? Absolutely. So this is, you know, in the early life stress studies, they did look at, first of all, developmental trauma. It's all to do with OP, which is other people, which means mm. the child's, child's relationship with other people, usually the key right. caregivers, right? So I often call it relational trauma. And it is something that's ongoing. It's ambient. It's there all the time. It's right, because our, our sense of safety is dependent. When we're little, we rely on other people to keep us safe. And so if we can't rely on them, we don't feel safe. And we never, we were stuck in that sympathetic, I might not be safe state. Well, this is exactly what happens because we have an epidemic of really, you could call it emotional neglect, emotional abuse and this is where we we don't fully because of it's not any blame going on here either you know parents can only do the best that they had with their parents so it's a societal kind of mass level of mass consciousness that we exist in at the moment because the, the the statistics are also at epidemic levels you know 55 percent of adults that are don't attach properly with mom because she's probably got a job she's depressed she's anxious she you know it's it's she's in difficulty and so the bonding between the child and the parent, it's to do with was the child emotionally seen, understood and validated. And when a child and the majority of children don't get that, they don't get enough of it. And not only do we have mirror neurons, which means that we our brain doesn't develop in isolation. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. It right. responds to social cues and we'll literally have nerves and cell brain cells, which to stimulated and grow in response to the interaction with the people around us so if we have hate to say it but sociopathic parents we probably won't develop many empathic nerves in our own brain right, right. So not having that behavior mirrored to us so when a child is neglected and i'm talking about emotional neglect, we're not talking about physical sexual abuse here that's another right. level and but that's really important to land on because i don't think people realize it could just be that you were a latchkey kid and you know you maybe saw your parents for dinner and no one asked about your day or if you had a fight with yes. your friend that's exactly i'm so glad thank you for just highlighting that because you could call it covert trauma we call it, I've also called it a silent ACE, silent adverse childhood event, silent, because it's, it's even more of a mind 
difficulty to come to terms with because it's, you can't say, well, I was hit or I was, you know, I was sexually abused. It's, it's not even that. It's just you were treated like you didn't exist. Yeah. And what that does to a small child, what I've come to understand through also doing my own healing with this type of attachment trauma, the child kind of goes into a type of emotional, psycho-emotional purgatory. It's like they don't exist. They're in, they sort of get, they sort of imagine a, a desert where the, the a small child is out in this desert on her or his own. No one's around. They can't really figure out if they exist or not. Right. And, you know, it's feelings of unreality and non-existence and complete detachment. And a, basically it's abandonment. It's, it's, a, it's abandonment. And so much stems from this core early life um, stress. And we've dramatically underestimated it. We can have a lifetime of addiction and patterns that come from this disconnect with ourselves and others. Well, that, that's my core issue too. And I went into overachievement drive, like these addiction, you know, we basically don't want to feel the pain, right? So we can numb ourselves in a number of ways. We can do alcohol or drugs, or like I used to run marathons because I, I would basically work so hard that I would collapse every night and never have to think and feel. Uh, is that exactly this so i work with the the enneagram system if people want to look up that it, enneagram institute as e double n e um e a g r a m it's just a system of nine different personality types it's just a tool to go okay attachment trauma makes you feel essentially not okay exactly uh, i'm not safe and it's not okay. So I need external validation constantly to how feel. It, yes. So you either become a type three, what you mentioned, the achiever type. Mm -hmm. You can become a type one perfectionist. If I just do everything perfectly, then I'll be okay. Yes. Um, if I just achieve and get enough external status, then I'll be okay. There's the giver types. Tons of therapists and mums are type twos. They felt that they didn't exist and they only existed and got validated when they helped other people. So then they learn that's how to exist. So then they, they become overgivers and then they end up, by the way, all of those end up with burnout, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia because the, pat, the behavior patterns and it's very- It's specific. not sustainable. No, that's it. And there's other ones, there's an anxiety type where the type six that kind of constantly feel that any moment the, the, the floor is just going to open up and they're going to disappear through the floor. You know, there's just no, none of those types have any sense of core sense of safety. Yes. It actually creates a type of psychosis actually of like, if I just do everything perfectly, I'll be okay. Uh, no, that's not how it works. Right. And that leads to eating disorders. And the weird thing is these are all externally validated, you know, like, oh my goodness, look, you're so successful. Look, you're so slender, whatever it is. And so society there's... totally, well, this is what I mean about being epidemic. It's we are, a society is set up to feed this disconnection from self and profit off it. So when this process of reconnection is, it tends to be completely life-changing because you really have to start looking at all, almost like attachments with external things that are draining you. They're not yes. feeding you, but yes. someone else has got their, some institutions, some, some corporation. Uh, corporations love achiever types. Perfect. Type <laughs> one is perfect. Like, you know, and that's what Amazon feeds on, those overachievers that are overworked and underpaid. I, I suspect that a lot of people that are listening are really identifying. And so I'd love to delve into how do you help people? How do you help yes. them shift out of that state? Right. Really great. One of the issues with developmental and attachment trauma is it's deep work and it's not obvious. Only People are probably only 50% aware of how much attachment trauma they have. Okay. Yes. It's only semi conscious. And one of the problems with it is you, talk therapy doesn't really get to it. Talk therapy doesn't really work. EMDR, EFT, and those kind of things are all for PTSD. That's not attachment trauma. <laughs> So one of the things to get to developmental trauma, there's, there's a range of approaches needed. And I can tell you, I'm working with this all the time, and I can tell you a few of the practical things that make yes. a big difference right away. Yes, because we can talk- The, the low-hanging fruit. Yes, we can talk till the cows come home about staying calm. It's not possible with somebody with deep imprints in the brain since childhood that they feel actually as a part of them that they're not connected to, that feels scared, alone, and in purgatory, yeah. and they can't explain it. It's You're very hard to feel safe. Yeah, it's, it's like- thanks, tell me to feel safe. And actually it just makes me feel worse because I can't do it. Like, I was I like when I was juggling everything in my life with the little kids and they're like, you know, 
oh, you just need to stress less. And I'm like, what am I going to do? Go to the spa for the day. The laundry still needs to get done. It lasts done. for the like, day. It lasts for the day. That's what happens with meditation. A lot of people, they feel calm when they meditate. Not to bash meditation. Meditation does help. It won't heal attachment trauma. And you, you the greatest... It's not psych- a one and done thing. You need to develop small incremental habits to slowly turn the Titanic. So exactly. So let's talk about three levels that I... Uh, that you can address I love it there, there are physiological things remember we've had an epigenetic reset of our nervous system which changes your gut it changes your lowers your immunity so it is important to address physiological aspects two things that are profound that i think everybody should do circadian rhythm management which is understanding about timing of when you eat food the timing of light your activity levels during the day, and also temperature. It's the four things, light, temperature, activity, and food timing. We're all completely out of whack because we live in a 24-7 society. We're eating in the middle of the night. We have uh, blue lights on in the evening when we should have darkness. And um, we you know, have central heating on during the day, and then it's like all at night, and it's, we're just not living. No, but what you're basically energy. saying is our body is designed to flow in a certain rhythm, and the more we can get in alignment with that rhythm, the more our body can return to balance and everything else. It's we're, almost like when you have too many tabs on your devices open, if you close one or two, it gives you more battery power. Yeah, you see, if you speak to the psychologist, they won't pick up on this. Like, this is the functional health recommendations. And my message is, like, we need both. So I would like no, I, to... I love that. Yeah, let's so circadian rhythm management. Go to bed earlier. Start going to bed at 9 o'clock. Get up with bright sunlight. Wear your blue blocking glasses in the evening time so that you're seeing orange light. Think about campfire light. When it gets dark, we don't want the blue lights, the LED lights and things like this. Don't eat three hours before bed if you can. Um, so what do you are, think of intermittent mm, fasting? Do you think that helps with the circadian rhythms? I think the three hours before bed not eating does work, but some people, their vagus nerve is so out of whack, so low vagal tone that they've lost, they've got some insulin resistance. And this is one of my other main physiological recommendations. That I think every psychology practitioner should have their patient be doing before they even start the psychotherapy, right? Circadian rhythm management, sleep, you're going to be more depressed and anxious if you didn't sleep properly. So have complete blackout in your room. There's like a whole set of recommendations. Just type in into Google circadian rhythm management recommendations. And there's lots of recommendations, you know, that people make. It's free online. So look into circadian rhythm management. The other thing is eating a diet that manages your blood sugar. Yes. Now, right now, I, I know this. That, that peaks the stress hormone, cortisol. If your blood sugar is off, it's really... You're going to have a roller coaster. Everybody has different tolerance levels for carbohydrates. And it can be one of these factors. There are people being diagnosed with anxiety and depression when they just, they're just eating too much carb for what their body can tolerate right now. We have this craze with the paleo diet. Yes, the paleo diet really will manage your blood sugar. And I, I put all my fatigue clients through it. Almost all of them are on a paleo type diet. So the high protein cut out the carbohydrates. The issue is, uh, to me, this is not a long-term diet. The only reason it's helping so many people is because their vagal tone is lowered. And if they got their vagal tone back, their insulin would become strong again. And then, uh, and I went through this process. I was putting weight on, um, I wasn't sleeping properly, and I couldn't tolerate carbs anymore. I lost my carb tolerance. And it was only because I did tons of rebalancing in the Vegas note. I can now eat bread. I can eat everything. And I don't put weight on my sleep really well. And my blood sugar has gone back. And so I'm going to a diet originally to manage my blood sugar was needed like a paleo type diet. It was a reset diet. You were resetting. You want to reset your circadian rhythms. You want to reset your vagal tone. Well, it helps. It's a bit of a short term help. The paleo diet I find is a short term help. So then let's talk about the nervous system things you need to do to reset the vagus nerve. I fa- I've been looking for a vagus nerve stimulator that I could recommend. <laughs> there's, t- there's 40 different ways of stimulating the vagus nerve. Yes. Chanting, meditation, om chanting, um, yoga is very important. Uh, there's tons of ways Essential to Essential oils. Yeah, there, yes. there are a million. Deep breathing is great. Freezing water, tongue depressors, coffee enemas. There, there are a lot of ways you can go. Yeah, and great to, breathing is probably one of the top ones meditation definitely but i was also interested in devices i have yes. no financial affiliation with this company there okay. is a device called modiushealth.com modiushealth 
M-O-D-I-U-S health.com. It's about $500. Uh, similar, you can buy it in Europe and the USA. And I, it's an, it connects to your iPhone. It was a, like a $2 million investment to make it. It's a neuroscientist in Ireland that created it. It's being marketed as a weight loss device, but they're bringing one out for sleep. That's just marketing. Is it's, that the one that they, there's like an electrical thing to your ear? Okay, it's actually, it stimulates the vagus nerve via the vestibular nerve. So the vestibular is behind the ears. Yep, I, that's, that's where I put oils, yeah. Yeah, you put them behind the ears, you, you stick the little connectors on and there's a wire and it's like a headband and it's just connecting to your phone. So it, re it works really well and it's just an hour a day. You can be do other, doing other things, sleeping, lying down, meditating or working on a computer. The only thing is not to walk around. I've had, I, I've, I'm just saying it because I get inundated with like, do you know a vagus nerve device that this is the only one I recommend, the only one I've tried, uh, though I've tried some others and didn't have good experiences. And it's like all the others are three and a half thousand to four thousand dollars. This one is five hundred. Right. So the Modius Health device changed my sleep completely. I put all my clients, I recommend make that recommendation now. So this is part of it. So you're building, you're going to get the circadian rhythm, you get your blood sugar control, then you bring in the modius. It might be three months of an hour a day as you start to realize, wow, I can actually start to eat more carbs here. Um, this is one of the things. Well, yeah, and you, the, the health, ben the benefit is additive and cumulative. So it's not like that's, that's the one thing. It's not like a magic pill, like boom, you take this and the next day you're different. You have to do this for a while. It took, you know, yeah, it's, <laughs> it took a while way, to get to where you are. It's going to take a while to unravel. And you also need to, to your point, you need a lifestyle. Hmm. Vagus nerve stimulation. It's like, how long should I stimulate my vagus nerve? That's like asking how long you should eat vegetables for. So how much it, salt do you put on your food? Yeah. You need to like, it becomes a way of life. So you want to bring in one of the things for attachment trauma, specifically yoga and body work, Feldenkrais therapy, um, yoga work, the trauma changes the brain and the way that we can change and reset the brain is it's actually through exercise and physical physical movement people don't realize this there's a brilliant book by dr norman doidge called the brain's way of healing highly that. recommended that book yeah when well, and, and i do on the feldenkrais and how that rebuilds neural pathways in the brain it reverses alzheimer's parkinson's people don't realize that physical exercise hugely important for brain health well, and, and the brain yoga, connects with the vagus nerve yes. yeah well the balance basically activates the brain and then also because the vagus nerve innervates all of the organs and the lungs anything you do like the deep breathing in yoga the holding the positions all of that is helping to kind of strengthen the communication from the body to the brain yes so right the other thing is i want to make sure we touch on this before the end of the interview how do you actually heal attachment trauma these feelings of lack of sense of safety it's almost like there's an inner child it is there's an inner child that's that is neglected and frightened to death and it's driving our behavior and it gets scared when we get scared and it, it is really inner child work so how do you do that work you know eft and emdr you can't it's a sort of it's an ongoing relationship with your own inner child that you want to build with there's a therapy called matrix re-imprinting which i want to highlight where um, you've got dr craig wiener does it penny kroll um and essentially that is it's a it's an offshoot from eft where you're actually guided to go back to childhood and connect with and talk to your inner child your young person your younger version of you and you actually make a connection and it, it, the, you could say the um it's always like it's never too late to have a happy childhood. So yes. you, you, as the adult, reparent. You bring in and you reparent, and you and you actually even you can go through certain scenarios that were particularly distressing. And you, as the adult, come in and you connect with your inner child through the imagination. And it's part. It's it works on energy on the energetic level. And this is the other thing which is fascinating is what I've discovered about trauma. I've been talking about trauma for years. You know what trauma leaves a biochemical imprint. It leaves an imprint in the nervous system, but where does it actually exist? It's in the energy field. It's actually why EFT and EMDR, they are energetic uh, therapies. And one of the most profound therapies that I've come across that will heal attachment trauma is sound therapy along the lines of Eileen McCusick's work, where she's doing biofield tuning fork therapy. It's my top recommended therapy now for attachment trauma because it was, you know, if you think, where does trauma exist? It's not, you can't find trauma by, you know, sort of cutting up a cell or a nerve in the brain. It's, you won't find it there, right? 
it was Carl Prebrum, who was one of the greatest neuroscientists who, not scientists who said, they exist in the field. Trauma and memories exist in the field around the brain. So right. it's in the field of all the neurons firing together. They're wired together, but they create an electrical field around the brain, all the neurons firing together. Right, the frequency. His, yeah, and his theory is, Carl Brubram, the German neuroscientist, said we think that the actual memories are probably in the field created. That's why EMDR works. That's why EFT works. It's why energy, uh, energy healing becomes very important. And sound therapy, well, it, we're talking about physics now because we need oscillation. We need to, if it's almost like a standing wave, let's say a trauma is a standing wave in the field, well, we right. can oscillate and shake up the trauma in the field. Like right. an, an opera singer can sing and she can break the glass, right? Right, right, right. That's it's what it's tuning like resonance. You can either kind of match the frequency resonance. or dissonance. You can offset it. And so, so this, this is what oils do too, but you yes. can use sound to kind of break the pattern. So, uh, essential oils are great with that. Very supportive to do along with sound therapy. Go and experience a sound bath. They they're exploding across the across. Yeah, they the have them places. a lot at yoga studios with the sound bowls. But tuning fork therapy, uh, I found that to be one of the most profound, and it's quite a few hours to to have needed to heal attachment trauma. But when you do enough of it, you will. It literally resonates. And I've been through amazing healing when I when I healed my attachment trauma because I had definitely had attachment trauma. I, I probably did about fifteen hours of biofield tuning therapy on my attachment trauma. My liver regenerated. My oh, liver yeah. Well, you to hold a lot of anger and resentment in your liver. And what's interesting for those that are listening and thinking, gosh, that sounds expensive, it's kind of like there's the Mercedes level, right? The Honda level, and then the, you know, used car level. And so I think for, for those that are listening, if they can afford it, absolutely, you know, find a practitioner. And um, FSM is another one. Anything that you can do for frequency. If you're, curious and you want to try this maybe yoga or essential oils there, there are some more affordable accessible ways to start yes um, so sound therapy uh there are i'm actually going to put i'm putting a course together on how to do sound therapy on yourself with your amazing. own tuning forks yeah so you just need to buy tuning forks and do it on yourself because oh. there's there's so many hours needed so that is a course that i'm bringing out oh, fantastic. But, yeah so i will be able to show people how to work on themselves but the the amazing thing is when you start bringing all that together, I, um, I basically, my liver started, I, I had a massive, uh, I couldn't tolerate caffeine at all. My sleep was completely out of where I couldn't tolerate carbohydrates. So just put all the weight on. So circadian rhythm really helped the paleo diet helped, but it's like, who wants to be on a paleo diet for the rest of your life? Cause it's not much fun. And <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, everyone's it's going limiting. on that, it? Yes. It's and limiting. also it's, yeah. it's too high protein fat ultimately for the long term i think there's other risks it's a lack of fiber there's issues i don't think it's a good long-term diet i think a more vegetarian based not completely but yeah i think i think, I think vegetables you know, and vegetables activate the gut microbiome which also can stimulate the vagus nerve there's yes i i think that you know vegan i think can be therapeutic for a while paleo for a while yes all of these things, therapeutic i think well, anything people, that shakes up your routine triggers yes new you're you're completely right so so I had the paleo in place. I had the circadian rhythm. I then had the modius, which started to change, uh, like the, reset my nervous system, even though it's marketed as weight loss, but it's because the vagus nerve will make your insulin more, you know, your less insulin resistant. But one of the side effects people were getting more improved sleep. So don't be distracted by being, being weight loss, but always check. You can, they're very good at answering questions if you need to ask the manufacturer. Right. Like, and, 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 and I want to land on why that, so the vagus nerve is basically the communication between the brain and the gut. And so if the vagus nerve is working better, it balances and normalizes. If, if you're it exhausted increases. all the time, Right. Yeah, it increases pancreatic enzyme output, increases exactly. your stomach acid production, it stimulates the peristaltic. Yes, it's uh, the vagus nerve, it turns off inflammation. The vagus nerve um, stimulates the sex hormones, it'll make you more fertile. It's like, so the vagus nerve is like rest, digest, detoxify, feed, and breed, which all gets down regulated. Vagal, low vagal tone is number one cause of digestive issues, I, I believe. And, and the low vagal tone can be caused by stress and heavy metals. But so just to say the last piece on this, once I then started to do all the biofield tuning and I started to heal my attachment trauma for the first time, I wasn't running around thinking, getting up in the morning, thinking the house is going to burn down or that my business was about to end or some of the hysterical response that if I'm truthful, it kind of 
whilst that because that's what you are when you're not in a sense of safety once that started to clear suddenly my the, i think the biggest cause of fatty liver and slow liver detox is being in a chronic state of stress which is coming from attachment trauma which is much you can't just talk about it or go and have a cup of tea you need you need to go much deeper and it's it, it's it's non-verbal right you have to get it at the energetic level which is things like sound therapy so um, my liver started to regenerate because my ca i'm on five cups of, of caffeine in a day now I've, I, i'm able to i'm just going carb crazy and i'm thinner than i've um, back in my 20s with how thin and I had an anti-aging anti -aged me as well so I'm working with all my clients doing that that right now it's like a it was a real amazing breakthrough to discover it I'm saying it it really works no so, it, it does because it's, yeah. it's it's also a really um you know big impact because it's what you're triggering the vagus nerve but it affects everything so yes. it's very low-hanging fruit like what you mentioned circadian rhythms vagus nerve diet all of these things are small pivots with huge impacts. Yes. And the other piece to it as well is when you're in chronic attachment trauma, so you're in that lack of sense of safety, the trying to overachieve perfectionism, whatever it is, your addiction, whatever you're trying to do, that level of stress actually creates pyroluria, which is a deficiency. A stress causes pyroluria. That's a deficiency in, in zinc, B6 and manganese. Once you're deficient in those, you're a vulnerable person to heavy metal buildup, lime, more likely to get impacted by mold and all these other things. So when we, when I'm rehabilitating somebody from what started with attachment trauma, it's very important. We do want to get the nutrient status back up again. The biggest issue I have dealing with healing all this is the emotional detox and the phys you get profound physical, emotional and physical detox symptoms. And that's been my biggest, uh, there's a lot of things. Lemon balm essential oil is super duper at uh, just um, breathing that in if you've got emotional detox symptoms. Yes. The other thing is lemon baths are a godsend. So it's 30 minutes doing like three lemons in a bath and just get in the bath with Epsom salts. And if you're feeling, because when you do sound therapy, it will mobilize the emotions. So you'll start. Yes. Uh, and and really binders, important. telling people to take um, binders even when they emotionally yes. detox. Because it's nothing that will detox heavy metals more strongly than healing emotional trauma. Exactly, exactly. Yes. But then all these toxins are mobilized and they wind up in, in the, the gut. Binders. And if you don't grab them with binders, they can get reabsorbed. So it's you're really absolutely, important. Yes, you're absolutely on track. The binders are massive. Binders, by the way, so what, what are binders? It's things like activated charcoal, perhaps zeolites, chlorella would work. Um, Psyllium. Bent, bentonite clay. So yes. these kind of binders. Sauna therapy is really important. I'll give people one other tip because I know we need to go, but I'll give people one other tip, last tip. Water is really important because emotions get stored in the waters of the body. And so it's one of the reasons why in ayahuasca and these plant-based medicine ceremonies, there's often purging because it's the medicine with the music, sound therapy, music, that stimulates the mobilization of negative energetic emotions. That then gets dumped into the waters of the body. So the purging is to get the, the, the emotional, the negative emotions out. Yes. So lemon baths neutralize it, but that's why sauna therapy is really good. And there's a, a brilliant water I recommend called waybackwater.com, waybackwater.com. It's the most hydrating water I've ever come across and it will hydrate you like nothing. And that's what enables you to do all the lemon bars and the sauna therapy. I mean, I was doing three hours of biofuel tuning a day. It was like being on a retreat, but I had to do like three hours of, all I did was lemon bars. <laughs> wow. So anyway, yes. Yeah, so that's my, um, that's it. That's, um, that's how this you need this. Amazing. I, I could talk to you all day. Thank you for every, this was so helpful. And thank my you pleasure. so much. Thank you, Jodie, for having me.